Awesome. Thank you. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. The number of participants has kind of stabilized. Okay, so welcome everybody to the ICSI Town Hall meeting. Uh, as you know, this is a this is a meeting where we all come together as a community and we can interact with some of the uh, most important professional societies in our community. Uh, today uh, we have a very tight agenda and we have the discussion at the end. Uh, when we get to the discussion portion, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you how I'm going to uh, handle questions. But for now, um, Tom, why don't you get us started? Okay. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. And you should be, let me know once you can see if the slides. Yeah, all good. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So thank you very much, Grace. Uh, I'm Tom Zimmerman. I'm the chair of ACM SIGSoft, and I'm going to say a few things and a few updates about SIGSoft. So first, what is SIGSoft? Uh, it is the ACM Special Interest Group on Software Engineering, and the mission is to improve our ability to engineer software. And the various strategies that SIGSoft is using for this, so one is by stimulating interaction among practitioners, researchers, and educators, like at conferences like ICSI, ISEC, FSE, ASE, and many other conferences, and by fostering the professional development of software engineers, and also by representing software engineers to professional, legal, and political entities. And if you are not yet a member of SIGSoft, I, I encourage you to join. It's actually not very expensive. It's between $10 and $30. And for various benefits uh, that SIGSoft provides you, like one of them is conferences, we run webinars and we also provide financial support for special and strategic pro projects and also conference attendee programs for students and professional six of members. And you get discounted registration fees at conferences. There are also many ways that you can participate in six uh, You can propose six initiatives. You can give actually talks at webinars or you can write for the software engineering notes, which is the six newsletters. You can nominate people for awards, or you can also just volunteer for six soft activities. And I now want to share a few updates of uh, things that uh, we've done also over the past year. So one of them is the six soft research highlights, which uh, you can find more information on this URL. And it's basically uh, you can think of the highlights of of all the six soft sponsored conferences over the course of a year. Um, and these papers show recent significant and exciting results that are of general interest to the entire computer science community. And basically, there's a nomination process. So six soft is asking the conference organizers uh, of its sponsor conferences to nominate papers, but also every six soft member can nominate a paper. So if you're seeing like outstanding papers here being presented at ICSI that you think are interesting uh, to people beyond software engineering, please go ahead and nominate these papers. Um, there's also a research highlights committee, which is chaired by Martin Robelia. And the members are Nic Nicole Novieli, Michael Bradl, Shaurab Shinha, Sebastian Uchitel, and Dong Mei Shang. And I can actually announce the first four research highlights that have been selected. So these are papers actually, um, actually not from this year. So there's a typo on the slide. It's actually from last year, from ICSI 2020. And these are the first four research highlights. 
What also happens for research highlights is that we're being recommended for communications of the ACM research highlights and some of these papers, not all of them, but some of them uh, will appear in communications of ACM. The other thing I briefly want to mention is the traditionally six soft used to have a travel program for conferences. This is now we are piloting a virtual format uh, to support free conference registration for virtual conferences for members of various groups, which you can see on this slide. We piloted the program for ICSI 21, and we had like 66 attendees that we provided free complimentary registration. We also have a SIGSOFT award program, and a few days ago, we announced the winners. i uh, just going to repeat them very quickly. So Prem Devanbu won the Outstanding Researcher Award, Katsuro Inoue won the Influential Educator Award, and Tao Xi won the uh, Distinguished Service Award. We also have an Impact Paper Award, which goes to Matt Dwyer, George Arunin, and James Corbett. The Early Career Research Award goes to Lingming Zhang. The Outstanding Dissertation Award goes to August Xi, and the Frank Anger, Frank Anger Memorial Award goes to Sumaya Almani. I want to make one. Uh, we're also going to make a few changes to the SIGSOFT award process going forward. And these are in response to a recent controversy surrounding the Turing Award winner, Jeffrey Allman, because the he made some uh, discriminating comments and there was uh, 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 many people were upset about this. And basically what we did in uh, response to this is we also reflected on physics of our processes and we thought about how we could improve physics of processes to prevent similar things happening at six of the awards. And so here are the steps that you're going to take forward. We are going to ensure diversity on all six soft award committees and also on all general committees. We're going to ask nominate, nominators to certify to the best of their knowledge that the candidate has not acted in any unethical way or against diversity and inclusion. We are also going to ask nominators to comment on how the candidate exemplifies the ACM core values, which among others include diversity and inclusion. And we also ask committees, the selection committees, to independently examine the candidate's background uh, to make sure that there are no violations. We are also, separately from this, we are also going to propose new six soft awards that specifically recognize outstanding contributions to diversity and inclusion activities and also to societal impact. And lastly, um, so some of you might know that the, the six soft elections going on, which means in, in about a month, we're going to have a new six soft executive committee, which is going to make decisions about six soft conferences. But at this point, I want to thank the, the outgoing six soft executive committee, which has served in its role for like the past three years for the outstanding work that they've done and the great insight that they provided. So thanks to Elisabetta, Dinito, Robert Dyer, Maria Mikic, Craig Rothermel, Sebastian Ukitel, and Nino Medivovic. So thank you so much for your dedicated service. Okay, that's it from my side. Great, thank you, Tom, very, very much. Uh, now, Rick, you will talk about TCSE. You're muted, Rick. I don't know why it does that. Can you see my screen? Yes, and we can hear you. Good, thank you. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, make a, a similar uh, presentation to Tom's, a brief introduction to TCSE. Um, yeah. Second. Okay, so, um, Similar to SIGSOFT, uh, the Technical Council on Software Engineering is your representative in uh, professional society, the IEEE, and the, the uh, Computer Society in this case. 
and uh, we have a very similar mission. So we work with the professional societies, we work with government, we work with academia. We're about 2000 members currently and we sponsor about 30 conferences every year. So uh, we're quite busy. This is the current board uh, exe executive committee of TCSE. And as you may notice, I'm not the chair. I'm the acting chair, uh, uh, hopefully for a short period of time. Laran Tabuldari is the current chair. And as many of you may know, she has um, experienced a personal tragedy and could not be here uh, because, of, because of that. And so uh, please send your, your good wishes and your thoughts and your, your uh, concern to Ladan at this difficult time in her life. And so um, I would like to thank her, of course, for everything that she's done and uh, um, uh, send our appreciation to her. Um, our other executive committee members are Nelly Bencomo, Grace Lewis, John Grundy, Nancy Mead, Tim Menzies, Housie Miller, and our TCSC representative from the Computer Society is uh, Sylvia Ceballos. Um, so what does TCSE do? Well, the, the thing that may affect you most directly, the things that may affect you most directly are that we provide financial support and technical support for conferences. I've been general chair of a number of conferences, just general chair of uh, SANER uh, a few months ago, virtual SANER, of course. Uh, I'm general chair of ICSA for 2022. And so I know from a personal perspective how much support we get from, from TCSE, from the societies to help us run these conferences, to help us do things in a professional way, um, uh, to guide us, to give us sometimes legal advice, financial advice. Uh, as, as academics, we're often um, a little bit limited in our knowledge of these things. And so I really appreciate the support that that TCSE gives us. They also sponsor publications, provide training opportunities, e-learning opportunities, and new initiatives. And I'd just like to spend a couple minutes talking about some of the new initiatives uh, that TCSE has been uh, pushing for the last year or two. And um, uh, much of the credit again here goes to Ladan. So, uh, she is very involved in diversity and inclusion. You may have noticed that when I introduced the executive committee, uh, a majority of them are women. So we, we are uh, trying to practice what we preach. Um, but other, other initiatives such as sustainability, emerging technologies. So, so uh, Grace, I stole this slide from you without permission, I hope that's okay. Um, uh, we're now, we, we now have a tremendous number of initiatives for diversity uh, and inclusion, uh, best practices, both carrots and sticks, right? So trying to both police what conferences are doing, but ideally trying to motivate and, and support conferences and being more diverse and being more inclusive. Uh, but we have other um, concerns that we're trying to support in TCSE. So one of the things that this COVID year, year and a bit, has brought into stark relief is the, the uh, environmental footprint that we have and the environmental damage that we do. And flying all over the world to conferences, we're contributing to that. And so we're starting to think about uh, some initiatives where we can um, potentially reduce our, our footprint uh, by a small amount, such as doing uh, associating carbon offsets with conferences. We're also, of course, interested in um, fostering and supporting emerging technologies. And so we've begun a new uh, annual conference on quantum computing. Our Housie Mueller was, was the first chair of that. Uh, in uh, 2020, and uh, we're currently planning the 2022 edition of, of the conference. And so that is um, 
always a, a focus or a thrust for us. Um, how can you participate in TCSE? Well, of course, we would love it if you could become a member. Membership is free. You can uh, go to the TCSE landing page at tc.computer.org slash TCSE and click the join button. Uh, I just ran here to this session from the TCSE awards session. And um, one of the things that we need the your support, your participation is nominating people for awards. Uh, we, as the, the people who are giving out the awards, cannot, should not, cannot uh, also be the nominators. So we rely on you, the community. You can volunteer for TCSE. You can become part of it. You can propose a, a TCSE initiative. This, these are your societies, both SIGSOFT and TCSE are your societies. And so I uh, encourage you both professionally and personally, it's very rewarding to be involved. So that's it for me. I'm happy to turn it back over to you, Grace. Thank you, Rick. Uh, next, we have Laurie Williams, who's going to talk about ICSI and the SC3 committee. I guess you can't unmute yourself once you share. Sorry about that. Everything's supposed to go so smoothly after a year and a half of practice, right? <clears throat> okay. So as Greg said, I'll talk about um, two different things. One is the SC3 committee, which you probably don't know what that is. Um, we just named this committee um, a couple weeks ago. Although last town hall, I talked about a joint meta committee, a joint meta steering committee of ICSI, FSC and ASC, as well as the representatives of the past chair and current chair of ACM and IEEE. Um, these are the names of the people on the committee. Um, and really the mission of this committee is for the good of the software engineering community so that the big three, these big three conferences can work together for the common good of the community. And you know what I'll say is being part of this committee um, and leading this committee is, you know, everyone on the committee is not territorial. They're really out the, for the good of the software engineering community. So we've had some great success in working together. Um, so some of the things that, and, and I went through some of this at the um, FSC town hall, but there are some updates. Um, and there was a big survey that we did about a year ago that you may have been a part of. Um, so we had two goals. Um, one was to geographically distribute the conferences throughout the world so that there wouldn't be a year, um, say, like two, two conferences in North America. We wanted, you know, again, as, as uh, Rick talked about having the environmental impact, um, we want for there to be a conference as close as possible to you every year of these three. So that was one of the goals. Um, and we're, as I'll talk about, we're able to um, achieve that by 2023. Um, and then the other one is to create a regular conference schedule, um, which, uh, you know, in the past, FSC and ASC have swapped, depending upon if it was in uh, Europe year or not. And now we're trying to distribute them throughout the year on a regular basis. So as far as geographic distribution, I have here the, the current locations. Um, and what you can see is by 2023, based upon, you know, contracts that were and plans that were already underway is the first year we're able to actually do that where ICSI is in Australia, um, FSC is in San Francisco, and ASC um, is in Luxembourg. And then we'll continue from 2024 onward. Um, and by 2024, ICSI will be moving earlier. So ICSI will now be more likely to be in April, and it'll be in April in 2024 and 2025, um, and onward, and, and potentially early May, but earlier. Um, and then ESIC FSC will be in late June or July, trying to separate them as much as possible. And then ASC in October to mid-November. So trying to spread throughout the year, there was a lot of conversation that went around that. Um, you know, we don't want to necessarily have a conference scheduled in, in some of the months 
you know, the winter months where it may not be desirable to go to a place as well as there could be trouble with, with just travel due to winter conditions. So we're really only, you know, from April through November, we didn't use the whole year, but this is what we settled on knowing it's not ideal that um, now um, ICSI may or may not be during your semester, which in North America, likely ICSI will be um, part of the semester. So I, I see some things in the chat. We'll get to the q and I'm sure that there will be some, some of the things I'm all talking about. There will be reactions, I'm sure. So those were the two goals that this SC3 committee worked on. Um, another community goal was around, you know, what we'll call dual deadlines. Um, the community goal was to provide the ability for authors to have a major minor revision with reviewer continuity and to improve the quality of the papers. Um, this is the pie chart of when we ran this community survey that 687 of you throughout the world answered last year. 62% um, were in support of this idea, 20% didn't care. And, 18% um, didn't like it. Um, we are moving forward. So we see it as this has 80% kind of support. Um, and in 2024, we'll move forward with a dual deadline for ICSI. And I'll talk about that more when we get to the ICSI steering committee. Um, ESIC FSC is also on board with the dual deadline. Um, and the ASC is not quite sure. I think the steering committee is still discussing it and a little bit wants to see how it goes with the rest of us. Um, and Max Depenta did a nice survey uh, and, and really studied and talked with program chairs in the security and database communities um, to get their experiences with this. And, um, and, you know, we were able to move forward again cooperatively between the three conferences. Um, another thing, and I'm going to save um, this for Mora to talk about mainly, but we did start, based upon the SC3 committee, a Journal First committee, because again, we, we saw that Journal First was an issue that crosses all of the conferences, and we didn't want to optimize um, for one conference, um, and, and I'll, I'll let him discuss it mainly, but what we really wanted for the community is to have some consistency and the policies not to change based upon who was the chair at any one time. So we want you, know, you to have some consistency and some expectancy of what to um, expect. We do just have these three journals, TSC, TOSUM, and Empirical Software Engineering for ICSI because to date, we've had so much interest that um, we have no more room in the schedule for other journals and other journals are interested, but we have not gone there. Um, and now just some updates of the ICSI steering committee itself. Um, and so if you, you know who's on the committee, it's the conference general chair and program chair, past three, anyone who's named, which is typically three years from, you know, their conference is three years from now, the current year and three years after they're serving. Um, ACM chair and two past chairs, IEEE chair and past chairs. That's, that's who's on the committee. I can't put all the names, it's about 38 people. Um, and so one of the big things that we have worked on um, is dual deadlines, as I kind of gave a preview. Um, and Peggy and Abik are gonna be the pioneers to push us into trying to figure out this dual deadline. Um, there's lots of details, many details to be worked out, which is you know, why it's good that we're getting started so early. Um, Peggy and Abik came up with a very preliminary proposed ICSI schedule, and I have it on here. Um, what, you know, FSC is likely to move into the dual deadline, that's the plan. But what we wanna make sure are that you don't have two deadlines in the same month. So right now it looks like it's like FSC will have a deadline in February, ICC in March, ASC in April. Um, then you may find out on that submission that you have a chance to revise it. And then that's the revision date um, to get final decision and then a camera ready. So you may have a camera ready for ICC 2024 by September, 2023. And that can go into the digital library at that point. Then there's another round. Um, and that other round is more along the lines of the classic schedule that we currently are working with. Um, but we, what you'll see is the decision of round one is in August. Papers are due for round two in August. So you're not able to go from round one to round two. You have to get that revision in place um, during the round one process. There's not a revision in the round two. So that's one thing. Um, Rick, Rick started to mention this already about sustainability. So we have some goals 
Um, one is to reduce the carbon footprint of our conferences. Another goal, which it relates in, in a certain way, which is to continue including members of our community who can't physically attend ICSI. And so that's something that we were able to do with these virtual conferences in 2020 and 2021, is people could participate that actually can't travel. Um, and so this is a conversation that's in process and we wanna get some community input on it. Um, and so, you know, hybrid conferences, fully virtual conferences could be a way to achieve those goals. And, um, but uh, so preliminary discussions, hybrid conferences where you have some people have a full physical experience the way we always used to have it, as well as also having everything taped and, you know, and broadcast is a ton of work, probably very expensive. Um, and then on top of that, there could be a case where funding agencies might start to say, you can't pay or schools might start to say, you, we, you can't go, just do the virtual. So it might, it has a possibility if we do the hybrid to make a lot of things fall apart. Um, another thing that was brought up was a fully virtual conference. So in the rotation, like, so sometimes North America, sometimes Europe, sometimes someplace else in the world and sometimes virtual. Um, that's a possibility. Um, and so some preliminary discussions that went on in the ICSI steering committee, as well as the SC3, is that um, in general, the three conferences, there was not a lot of interest in like saying, yes, let's now have four different options. And once every three years, our conference will be fully virtual. Like just people didn't feel good about that, um, as well as the fact that these virtual conferences are a massive amount of work as Natalia and Oscar and those um, who've done it before know. And so who, who will volunteer to just do that? I mean, you know, the work that goes into a conference people wanna bring, they're all of their friends from all over the world into their community. And if you don't have that, you know, will people be willing? So that, that was the downside. The other thing that was discussed was to have some kind of a carbon offset tax as part of the registration. Um, and we have some next steps. So these, I'm just telling you things that are under discussion. Um, you know, we thought about having a survey to really see, you know, what, what can we do? What can we do to achieve those goals that I have at the top? What, are, what is a solution that we can have? You know, can we have keynotes broadcast? Can we have online communities? Um, but a fully physical conference. So anyway, your input would be welcome. Um, a change that we made, uh, I've been the steering committee chair for a couple of years, and this was one of the things that was done early, but I don't know if the community knew, which is to have the SCP, SEIP, so software engineering and practice industry chair as part of the steering committee. In the past, it's been program chairs and general chairs, now we specifically want to make sure that we can be as open and responsive to the needs of industry at ICSI as much as possible. So these are our industry members of the steering committee and mo going forward, we will always make sure, number one, that we have an industry person as an SEIP chair, and number two, that they can be um, on the steering committee and we can hear the voice within our you know, decision-making process of what's good for industry. Um, and then this is my last slide. And this is, you know, I'll, is again, something that is a recent topic. Um, a lot of push lately on open science and rules for open science and contributing your, you know, replicatable uh, methodology and your data, uh, which is fantastic for science and building science. But then there has been a movement as open science has gotten stronger and stronger is like the, not accepting industrial research papers because the artifacts can't be contributed and or some problems with um, qualitative studies where the data can't be contributed due to pri protecting privacy. And so, you know, in a holistic science of software engineering, um, we, we can't just have only open source and only papers where the data can be contributed. So um, Dana and Andreas are working out some, like, you know, some frequently asked questions are highly supportive of making sure that we have a holistic view of the papers that we 
will accept into ICSI. So we can be representative of actually the industry as a whole. Um, and so these are guidelines that are being developed um, as we speak and Andreas and, and Dana should be um, finalizing those and getting them posted. And I think that's it. Okay, right. thank you. Oh, okay, great. Thank you so much, Lori. There, there's a lot of discussion in the chat, but I, I, in because of time, I would rather just make sure that we send you the chat because it's mostly comments. Actually, the community has already answered most of the questions. So okay. that's always great. Uh, Mauro, we have you finally. Mauro Petze is gonna talk about journal first. Yes, uh, thank you. Sorry, it took me a while to get through the, uh, through the, um, through Zoom, I don't know why, but now I'm here. And uh, I give you a quick report. I hope you can see my slides. Uh, it's a very quick report. So I'm, uh, I'm serving as uh, the uh, say coordinator of this working group, uh, which is for Junior First. It's a working group that uh, get together uh, responsible for TSC, TOSM, EMC, ICSI, ESECFC, and ASC. And we're trying to actually figure out how to deal better with the Journal First. Uh, there is a <clears throat> fairly important issue, which is there has been a, a, an explosion of Journal First papers. I don't have uh, on the slide all the data, but just to look at ICSI or ESECFC, you know, in ICSI this year, we have uh, 137 technical papers, if I compute it correctly, and 75 Journal First papers. At the, is FSC, we have uh, this year 93 technical papers and 72 junior first papers. So we are getting to the point the junior first paper get almost at the same level of technical papers. Uh, also, there is an uneven distribution among conferences and uh, the, uh, the process is fairly heterogeneous and on, on a daily basis, on a one-to-one -one basis. You know, I, I, I have the opportunity of uh, coordinating the work of the editorial board of uh, TOZEM. And I got once in a while this request for some committee saying, oh, hi, we are the committee for junior first for XC or for FSC or for ASC. Can you give us some access? And so basically there is a fairly, fairly little, uh, uh, little coordination. And so uh, I think it's fairly obvious uh, at this point with this volume, uh, we need some coordination. And we, I think, you know, a junior first requires or uh, invites papers for many different uh, areas in many different conferences. So there's not only these three conferences, not only these three uh, journals, but we thought that uh, if we could coordinate three journals, three conferences, we do already, we will do already a good job, even if uh, uh, it's partial in some sense. And, and so we tried to figure out, we met a few times and uh, we found some, uh, uh, some co uh, agreement. And before getting to a conclusion and getting to a sort of working process, uh, we thought it was nice to share this uh, idea, so preliminary ideas with uh, this uh, uh, with the community to see what is the feedback of the community. So, uh, first of all, we noticed that uh, although we have a fairly similar definition, there is no unique definition. So different journals and different companies have a slightly different uh, definition of journal form first. And we try to find out whether there is a first sort of possible to get the uniformity in the definition. And uh, well, this is what uh, we ended up with, which is, uh, Paper that report completely new research results or present a novel contribution that significantly extend and were not previously reported in, pre in prior work. This is already shared among all. Now, uh, there is some sort of refinement to this, which is uh, borrowed from uh, actually uh, the contribution is on TSC, uh, which is uh, must differ more than 70% from any previous publication. Uh, there is an issue or there has been an issue which is uh, does a publication in a, the XCNR or the FSC Vision track, which is only four pages, uh, is, is it considered a, a previous publication that actually not, uh, prevent the paper to be a journal first paper or not? Is that a, a short paper or a short communication, a short demo to a workshop, a workshop a prior publication or not? And uh, the idea of the team is that uh, the community is fairly, uh, um, into this idea that it's, especially when you submit a paper to a, to a journal, there is this idea of the 30% novel contribution in, uh, in a journal paper with respect to the previous paper. I know 
uh, and I have a lot of experience as, uh, as editor in chief of Tourism, but this is leads to some long discussion sometimes. But on the other side, I think there is a split, a sort of uh, general agreement. So we thought that uh, this idea of saying more than 70% from MVP publication is a sort of fair way of quantifying the differences. Also, TSC requires the, the, the authors to uh, justify the novelty with a 200 word statement. And I think this is also something that we should do. So this is the first idea is to uh, uniform the definition of journal first in all the, at least the three journal, journals and the three conferences. Second topic that was under discussion is a coordinated process. Um, and this has been a bit more controversial, to be honest. You know, it took a bit more to actually get to a, a, a general feeling. But uh, eventually, uh, we discussed about the idea of having a unique committee or different committees. And given that the conferences are not synchronous and that the selection is not synchronous, we think that it makes sense to have different committees for the different conferences at the same time have a same process and the same uh, the coordination, a full coordination about among this process. So uh, we will have different committees for the three conferences. So that's a proposal at least. Uh, uh, we will actually get the same time window for all conferences, which is 12 months before the, uh, uh, before the selection. And uh, since for each conference, each conference is an annual conference and each is coming and each has a 12-period 12, 12 conference, there will be a complete overlap. And so every paper which is submitted at Journal First Paper will qualify for every conference. Uh, at this, uh, and at the same time, <clears throat> so there is no overlap for the same conference. So the XE will have a, a separated, separated uh, uh, periods. So uh, XE, uh, FAC will have uh, separated periods overlapping with XE, of course. Okay, and uh, there was uh, a, another thing which is uh, uh, ask the conferences to give a minimum capacity because of course, if the number of junior first papers will grow over a given threshold, we may be required or maybe we need, or some conference may decide not to accept all junior first papers. My personal opinion, but that's my personal opinion, is that I think, uh, you know, the more we present, the more we share ideas, the better it's for the community, but I also understand that as, uh, having organized uh, X some years ago, that organizing too many too many sessions with too many papers is difficult. So in general, we would actually suggest that to have a, a limited amount, Mauro, a minimal minute. amount. Yes, please. One minute, Mauro. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. Okay. And uh, the idea would be to get it a percentage on the number of, uh, of papers of the, of the conference, of the conference. Now, I, I put that 50% that that's to be discussed. Okay, let me go to the next, uh, the last slide, which is uh, uh, how to select a privileged paper published in the first part of the eligible windows, just to avoid papers, you know, first paper to age too long. So you submit a paper in, in in January, not, not selected yet, and it's already December, gives priority to that paper. Uh, require each paper to be presented by a different author. So the discussion was, we don't want to have the same paper or several papers to uh, in the same, you know, the question, can we have several papers of the same author set in uh, the same conference? Yes, but we want each paper to be presented by a different author. So if it's a, a big group with many PhD students, each PhD student will present his own work or her own work and the presentation at the single event. That's it. Uh, Tom is working hard on uh, the community survey. He will distribute the community survey very soon. And it's very, very important for us to get uh, your feedback and your comment. I'll read the chat now and I'll let Grace continue. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Mauro. And now we reach the discussion part of the town hall. Uh, the way that we're going to do this is uh, we received a couple of questions uh, via the form that Tom uh, published. I am going to go through those first. Um, after that, uh, happy to uh, moderate any questions. The way to do that is to please raise your hand um, and I'll just uh, take them in the order in which they appear in my, my participant Zoom window. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and start with the, uh, with the first question. This is a question mainly for uh, Tom and Rick. Uh, how is SIGSOFT man managing the new ACM viol violations database 
for people who have been banned from attending or participating in ACM, ACM events, um, there was a link, I'm sure everybody knows the event that we're talking about. And how is TCSC dealing with these violators? Does IEEE have something similar? So maybe Tom, can you answer first? Uh, sure, and I'm gonna paste the link into the chat that uh, was pasted with the question. So basically, uh, and this link has some more background information um, than what I can tell you in the time that we have. But basically what ACM has been started doing is they, um, so for various policies that ACM has, uh, including like, like when you do publication violations, but also policies against uh, discrimination and harassment. And sometimes when people, like when people violate these policies and when it is brought to the attention of ACM is that ACM uh, puts sanctions on people. For example, that they cannot publish at a conference anymore or that they're blocked from, from attending a conference. And so uh, basically what's new is, so this database has been around for a while. It was just not very clear how to query against the database and who can query against the database. And now what ACM has been doing is it implemented a process that basically volunteers and conference leaders can submit queries against the database and then they get some notification if someone has been blocked from certain activities. And uh, so if you think about Sixsoft, Sixsoft is, runs many conferences with many volunteers. Um, if you think of like just program committees, right? The, the program committee of ICSI, the main technical jack, has 100 plus people. If you take all committees together, it's like probably 500 to 1,000 people. So all of these kind of would have to be screened against this database. And so there's a whole, whole process involved. And um, right now we are still discussing at Sixsoft what will be the exact process to query against the database because also you don't want to give everyone the access to the database. So only certain people uh, are able to query against the database. So we are figuring out the detailed process. It will likely be similar to the process uh, that Sikai is following and I pasted the link in the chat. Um, so for volunteer appointments, we are already screening against the database. For conference attendees, uh, basically it will uh, will be part of a registration system. So some of it might be done automatically. Um, and in some cases, people might have to send an email request to ACM to screen the attendee list and to prevent anyone from registering. Um, so that's one way we are addressing this. The other thing we wanna do is for like many uh, six established CARES committee, committees which basically serve as a resource for people who experience discrimination and or harassment in violation of ACM policies. And so we also gonna establish a CARES committee uh, to basically support people who want to report violations. Thank you, Tom. Uh, would you, uh, Rick, can you address the same question from the IEEE side? Yeah, well, actually you, you may know the answers to these better than me, Grace. Um, uh, I can, uh, speak from a personal perspective that I've actually been involved in uh, several ethics uh, violation committees and investigations over the last year or so. And uh, the Computer Society takes these very seriously. But my impression is that we do not yet have a standardized process. And I think that this is something that we are now looking to create. And so we are. Uh, uh, going to learn maybe from what Tom and, and Sixsoft are doing. Um, we, we solicit community input, but to my knowledge, there is not, there are not established rules in place yet. And this is in part why I've been on these committees as we're trying to figure these out now, talking with IEEE legal, talking with members of the community. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this question is for all the speakers. While ICSI, ICSI 2022's open science policies are a step in the right direction, can we make these mandatory? So maybe I'll start with that since I'm still unmuted. Um, I think that, uh, well, we, we just heard a little bit uh, about open science and some of the issues 
such as uh, uh, the potential conflict with proprietary industrial research and, and concerns. The other issue that uh, we've been struggling with is how that affects double-blind reviewing. Um, if you are required to anonymize your data set to meet the open science guidelines, that can be a significant burden on submitters to remove all potentially identifiable information from code, from data, from all the artifacts. It's really a very high bar. And so we need to think carefully as a community as to what we think is necessary. Are we perhaps over-policing ourselves uh, versus what, um, what we think should be encouraged? So I, 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 personally, I'm in favor of encouragement rather than setting uh, hard rules. So Tom, I, I'll open it to you. Thank you. Tom or Laurie, would you like to um, add something? No, I mean, I, you know, I'll just reiterate very briefly because I know we're running out of time. The same thing that, I mean, we as a community, I, I think as Rick said, encouragement is good. Um, I've seen in my personal experience, some reviewers being rigid already and considering it mandatory. And so that is affecting the profile of the papers that can be accepted. And I think that we need to go into a different direction. And, you know, I propose that we become develop best practices in publishing industry paper, research papers, and best practices in publishing qualitative papers for privacy, like best practices so that we can have a holistic view of software engineering and not the type of software engineering where you can, you know, all, the only representative of the type where you can um, submit your artifacts. Okay. And if you're reviewing a paper, just keep that in mind. It's not mandatory at this point. And so don't, don't hold it mandatory for yourself. Agree. So the, uh, the third uh, question here, it's more of a comment than a, than a question, but obviously if you, if any of you has any comments, feel free. It says, while ICSI has historically managed well, the potential conflicts of interest between authors and reviewers, each submission and each accepted paper should also have a mandatory statement on the author's financial interests. And the example is startup companies the author may be involved with. And uh, the person that, that shared this uh, posted a, a link uh, to Nature, which I'll uh, post on the chat. Uh, any comments uh, regarding that a conflict, of interest, in, conflict of interest with financial interests? Yeah. <laughs> I, I um, mean, I... I yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, I think I'll, I'll kind of reiterate the last set of comments is, is perhaps we are fixing a problem that doesn't exist or barely exists in practice. I, I don't think it's a bad idea, but I mean, the more rules, the more mechanisms we put in place, the more procedures just raises the bar for everybody, increases the workload for everybody. I'm, I, I'm not sure this is a problem that needs fixing at the moment. Yeah, I would agree with Rick and say I've certainly been to other conferences where you go to a presentation and the presentation is actually a commercial for their company. I've, I can't really say I've, I've experienced that at ICSI because I think our bar for science is high, even like, you know, the software engineering practice track, like we don't accept commercial paper. So I don't think I would agree with Rick. It's, it's not a problem that maybe something slips through, but I, th I don't think it's a general problem. Okay. And at this point, uh, I am willing to take questions from the audience. So if anybody has a question, please feel free to raise your hand. If not, I can just bring up topics. Yeah, I mean, I, if I, until people raise their hand, I'll I'll comment on some of the things that were in the chat. So oh, go Neil, for it. Neil talked about you know maybe we need to look at less conferences, and I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'll just say we have. That was part of uh, like a lot of the discussions in the SC3 committee, and even you know the survey that we did last year. And um, at this point, there wasn't an interest in reducing the conferences, but by geographically distributing, what we're more trying to do is encourage you to pick one or pick two, maybe not pick three. 
And so, um, you know, if we went, if we reduce the conferences to one or two, then we are going to go back to forcing people to maybe travel longer. So that was the, at least, you know, the temporary conversation on that issue. Um, and Ahmed, you mentioned about like, free content or why do we have this all behind the cloud or paywall and Natalia I believe or Oscar said that the, our content will be posted and that's awesome and that's really the goal like part of the goal that we said as far as we we don't want when we go back to physical conferences we want to include the world and so things like that can help us include the world. Um, Alex talked about like is it possible with Journal First that maybe someday we'll have a quarter of direct um, contributions and three quarters of the conference will be journal first. And that is the issue. That is one of the big issues that we need to examine with the community survey that um, Tom and company will be sending out because there are some people in this community who would say, absolutely, that's what we want. We want that kind of conference. And then there's another whole set of people who say, no, we don't want that kind of conference. Mm -hmm. We want mainly direct contributions. Mm -hmm. And the the SC3 committee, committee and the steering committee were the stewards of you. And so what we really need to find out is, you know, really what does the community want and, and how can we be stewards of, of the community? So that, that was all I got from the- Yeah, no, that, that was, before. yep, that was a good summary. <laughs> Great. Other hands? Any, yeah, any, any hands, any questions from the audience? You guys are never this shy, ever. I know. Brittany, you said you wanted to, to, you know, establish some controversy. Did you say that? I said I wanted to come because it's always really interesting and engaging. Um, controversy, you know, sometimes is part of it as well, and you know, but there's no wine involved. I don't know. I can't speak for everyone, but that's, that's true. No. So that's may, true. maybe that's, you know, affecting the the openness that's. Yeah, there you go. Oh, we, we have a hand. Yes, Yay. we have a hand. Rohan, go ahead. Hey, um, so I have a question relating to the issue of, um, I guess, folks who may not be able to travel to uh, certain conferences in person and you know whether we can do things like hybrid or virtual. So I know that in other communities, and I think uh, particularly to CSCW, uh, they have reciprocal agreements with other conferences in the same area so that if an author of a, a paper that's accepted cannot travel to present, they can present at a sister conference in the same year that may be located in a uh, location that's, that's preferable. And given now that we have, uh, you know, the proposal for having uh, the ESEC, FSC, XC, and ASC at like different locations throughout the year, I was wondering if uh, this sort of idea ever came up in discussion or what any of your thoughts are on having reciprocal agreements with other SC conferences. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that solution. That's not a solution that we've talked about. And so I appreciate you throwing that into the mix. Um, there's really two issues that, you know, that we'd be working with. One is authors. So like, what about an author who just can't travel? Um, and it could be visa restrictions or, you know, COVID restrictions. Um, can, can we have some so limited selection of people who, did, who could present remotely? That's one issue. And then the other issue is just, what about just people who can never come? You know, it's just too expensive. And um, I'll say, you know, we're working on both of those. We're discussing both of those issues. And so I appreciate you throwing another possible solution in. Great, thank you. Abhik, you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Grace. Um, so I have a question about the journal first uh, uh, papers. So in fact, this is a topic we are just discussing uh, with respect to ESEC FSC 2022 in, in terms of the planning. So mm -hmm. whether to have a large number of journal first papers or uh, whether to have lesser number of journal first papers, but give them a larger speaking slot. So uh, I guess it depends on how we see the journal first papers. Is it a reminder mechanism, a shout out to the community that, hey, this paper has appeared in the journal and please look up this paper, then we can accept more number of journal first papers, but give them uh, shorter slots. Or it's really a presentation, in which case one of the criteria for acceptance of the journal first paper can be that this paper is likely to generate more discussion in the conference. So mm -hmm. what does the community feel about that? Uh, this would actually also help in our planning for the upcoming ESEC FSC conference. So. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, I, I can comment, although Mauro, do you wanna? Uh, uh, I guess I, I'll comment and my comments really just that, um, you know, what the question that you're asking is something that that big committee that Mauro is the chair for, for um, does need to work on. Um, because we don't want these types of decisions that you're trying to make for FSC 2022 to be vastly different than another chair might make for ASC 2021. Like we, we want the experience of the authors to be as consistent as possible between the conferences. And, um, and so like, you know, can you, ex can you expect to be accepted? Can you expect to be rejected? You know, it, it, all of this needs to be much more consistent. Um, we've had a great signal in the past, you know, ICSI um, has gotten so many journal firsts and the other conferences have had to solicit. And this year, FSC has like 71, I think, which that's awesome. Eight, um, ICSI got, you know, a smaller number and FSC got a larger number. And that's great because what we really need as a community is for journal first authors to be ready to, to present at any of the conferences and not to be so ICSI centric. So I know that didn't answer your question, but only to say we, we need to work this out so that each chair is not making the decision and that the experience of the authors would be varying based upon the chair. It's, oh yeah, I absolutely agree. It would be good yeah. if the conference chairs don't have to make the decision. Right, right. If I can, uh, if I may add something about this, uh, just quick. Sure. Uh, this is a topic that we did not discuss in this in the work in the in, in, in the working group yet, but I think it's a very important topic. Uh, but I fully agree with Laurie. I mean, uh, there may be different reasons to get either of the two choices, mm -hmm. but we should be consistent. Okay. Mm -hmm. And probably the most uh, pro most likely solution would be to to go for so for a, a regional trade off, give some space to present the paper, but try to give also the chance to many authors to present the mm -hmm. paper. Uh, we actually ended up by trying to, at least at this point, uh, see whether we can pass the principle of uniformity among conferences, because this idea that actually some conferences, ICSI used to host a lot of journal first and others host, used to host much less uh, journals first was not very, very mm, nice, I would say, to, to the authors. Right. And, and one thing I'll say is when, you know, I was involved way back at the beginning of the journal first initiative, whenever that was, and like the the two main objectives of the journal first program. Um, one was to revive the journals and we have done that. Like all of the, the three journals that we work with have seen a lot more submissions. And so that's awesome. Mm -hmm. We achieved that objective. Um, the other is to bring more people into our community and to like allow more people to attend ICSI. Um, so, and we have also, I mean, we, we've shown slides in previous town halls that's, that substantiate that we do that. And that's why um, Moro, when he talked before, he mentioned about different papers having different authors um, because what we want more people, more different people to be presenting. And that's part of the Journal First goal. Um, so like in general, the Journal First program has succeeded in the initial objectives. Okay. Okay, in the in the interest of time, I'm going to have to stop because we do have a little bit of Vixie left and there's a, there are more paper sessions starting right now, I believe. So uh, thank you, thank you, Tom, thank you, Rick, thank you, Laurie, thank you, Mauro, for your uh, presentations. Uh, we are gonna make sure that this video goes up on on, on Clouder and also the, the chat session is also being saved. And after we're done, I'm gonna go ahead and send it to, to all of you so that you can take a look at the, at the discussions and all the comments that were made, especially towards the end that we're not gonna be able to get to. Thank you very much everybody for attending. Thank you.